All right, praise the Lord. That's true, isn't it? We're never alone. If we're filled with his spirit, if his spirit is living within us, he's always with us. We're never alone. He's always faithful. No matter how many times we fail him, he is always faithful. Amen? Aren't you glad you live for God? Amen. Well, welcome, church. Welcome to Hope City Church Wednesday night Bible study. And we're going to study the Bible tonight. I hope that's okay. All right. That's what we're here for. Amen. Well, uh, pastor's out of town. I appreciate the opportunity to, you know, I want to give honor to him. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to teach to you. And he asked me to teach, and I had a lesson kind of planned out, outlined a little bit. And then due to request from several of you tonight, I decided to change my topic, and he was okay with it. So I'm going to be continuing my series about Revelation that I started a long time ago. 20 years? Not 20 years ago, nah. It's been a while, though. It's been a while. All right. So that we'll just we got the slides here. I think I had a verse before that actually. All right. We'll start right away. If you have your Bibles with you, um, or a electronic tablet, or a smartphone, or something. If you don't, I'll, I'll have the slides up here with the scripture verses, and I will be reading out of the New King James Version. If you have the King James Version, should be okay. All right. We'll start with Revelation. 1 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And this is going to be continuing the series, the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this opportunity to come here tonight and worship you and feel your presence, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray you'd help me to teach what you want me to teach tonight, Lord, and you'd touch our minds tonight, touch our ears, touch our hearts, help us to understand your word. This is not about us, Lord. It's not about me. It's about you, Lord. I pray that your will would be done. You would be glorified, Lord Jesus. All the glory goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, before we begin tonight's main lesson, I want to do a little bit of review, brief review. All right. Next slide here. Quick review. We're going to do a quick review. All right, quick review of chapter one. Now, in, yeah, please be seated, sorry. All right. Now, in chapter one, if you remember the Apostle John, not me, but the real one, the Apostle John. He's better than I am. Okay, Apostle John is exiled to the Isle of Patmos, a small island in the Aegean Sea between Greece and Turkey, and he addresses this letter, the book, to the seven churches of Asia, which were located in modern-day Western Turkey. Now, he hears a voice, He's praying and he hears a voice. He sees a vision of Jesus Christ in majesty and power, this great image of Jesus. And Jesus tells John to write what he sees and what he's told. All right, chapter 2, and he writes a letter to these seven churches. So in chapter 2, uh, the first four, the message to the church at Ephesus, then the church at Smyrna, the church at Pergamos, and the church at Theatira, 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 whatever. Okay, chapter 3, the remainder, church of Sardis, Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Laodicea. Okay, now, chapter 4, John hears a voice telling him after the church's letters, and, you know, Jesus talked to the churches, and he said, okay, you know, um, good job, you're doing good here, you're not doing so good here, uh, keep it up, and, you know, you'll get a blessing. If you don't, you're in trouble. So then after this is all over, John hears a voice telling him to come up here and see what will take place after these things. After he shows them about the church, what's going to take place after that. Then he sees a great throne in heaven. He sees God seated on that throne, and he sees 24 elders and four living creatures around the throne worshiping God. In chapter 5, the one seated on the throne holds a scroll with seven seals on it. Okay, the seals are the little wax things holding it together. And he says, he asks, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, takes the scroll to open it. And the elders, the four living creatures, and a multitude of angels rejoice and worship God that he was worthy to open this, to loose the seals and open the scroll. And a quick review, some important points. Now, the seven churches of Asia were seven literal churches. They were actual churches of that time. But they also can represent the church age in general. You know, these are letters to the churches. They can apply to any of us today, any church and the 24 elders uh, are symbolic of the church. You know, I went into that in detail in that chapter. Uh, I believe that's symbolic of the church. And 
the remainder of the book, chapters 6 through 18, well, it's not quite the remainder, but most of the book, uh, deals with the great tribulation, okay, a great time of trial and God's wrath being poured out on the earth, and it's not strictly chronological. I went over the kind of a structure, a brief structure of it in one of the lessons of, it's, you know, there's little, uh, they call them parentheses, like he's going through the narrative and then he says, oh, by the way, here's some more detail about this particular thing. It's not strictly chronological. So we want to keep all that in mind going into chapter 6. That's what we're going to learn about tonight. And we're not going to do the entire chapter tonight because there's way too much material. I'm just going to do the first four seals. And we, I'll probably be able to get that done, uh, what I have here in the slides. Uh, if not, not a big deal. I can always stop it wherever. All right, so we're going to start with Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. Let's get into it. All right. Now this is John again speaking. He says, now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. So he's starting to open the seals now on the scroll. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed, out, followed with him. And power was given to, that, to them, over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death. Now, you're killing people with death. That's pretty serious. You love those old, ancient, you know, kind of idiosyncrasies like that. Kill them with death. They're really dead, you know. And by the beasts of the earth. All right, here's a picture of the four. I, I just found this online. It's kind of cool looking. Picture of the four horsemen here. See the white horse in the front there? He's got a bow. It's kind of like a lightning-looking bow there. And the red horse over on the side, he's got the flaming mane and a, holding a sword. And you see the black horse over here. He's got, like, glowing purple eyes on the horse. And then the, kind of a green-looking horse there. It looks like the Grim Reaper on there. He's got, like, a big reaper a scythe thing there in the front. That's kind of cool looking. I don't know if exactly what it looked like, but I thought that was kind of a neat picture. So anyway, these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, we learned before the apocalypse just means... Revelation. So they're the four horsemen of Revelation. Now, who are the four horsemen? What do they represent? What are these? It's kind of scary, but what are they? You hear about them all the time, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Well, we'll take a look at it. We're going to take a look at it tonight, a few different views, and we're going to look at the text itself to come up with what we feel, or what I feel is the best explanation. Now, before we begin... We, we want to make sure we let the biblical text speak for itself. We don't want to read anything into it. Make sense? We don't want to hold on to a, maybe a certain viewpoint that we've had for a long time just because we like it. Or maybe it makes us feel warm and fuzzy. You know? <laughs> now, if we disagree with a certain viewpoint, it's the viewpoint, not the person holding that view, that we're going to critique. So we're going to look at different views we're not going to criticize people. Everybody clear on that? All right. Now remember that these are not salvation issues, okay? A lot of this symbolism in Revelation, there are different views, different ways of looking at it. So it's okay to have different views. It's okay if you want to be wrong. I'm just kidding. I'm going to tell you what I feel is the best view, but you're welcome to disagree. We're here to learn about God's word and have fun, right? All right. Now, one view holds that the horsemen are four different forces acting on the world, okay? Four different events, different forces. The white horse, this, according to this view, 
is either Jesus Christ or the Antichrist going forth to conquer. The red horse symbolizes war. The black horse symbolizes poverty and famine. Next slide. The pale horse represents disease, death, and hell. This could be called a classic interpretation of the first four seals. Uh, many, most Bible scholars, I would say Bible scholars who believe the Bible, that sounds like an oxymoron, but nowadays some of them don't. Most Bible scholars hold to this view, okay? Another view also holds that the horsemen are four different forces acting on the world, okay? But they're socio-political and economic movements rather than abstract forces. The white horse, according to this view, symbolizes Catholicism, the rider's the Pope. The red horse symbolizes communism. The black horse symbolizes capitalism. The pale horse is actually green and symbolizes Islam. Okay? Now, these are the two views that we're going to consider here tonight. Now, other views are held by people who don't really believe the Bible is God's word. You know, some, they, maybe it's kind of a mystical, allegorical view. It's just a spiritual struggle. It's not really predicting anything, so you, you don't need to worry about it. Don't even try to understand it. Okay, but we're not going to look at that view. Um, trying to demonstrate that we believe that God's word is inspired and that God actually exists, that's kind of beyond the scope of my lesson tonight. So we're not going to get into that, but suffice to say, God's real, the Bible's his word, so we're going to look at two views that say that it's God's word. All right, let's get going. Everybody got your thinking caps on? Okay, starting again with verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb, that's Jesus, opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. Now here we see the Lamb, that's Jesus, beginning to open the seals on the scroll. So he's, you can't read the scroll until all the seals are opened, okay? So he's just starting to open it. And he's setting these events into motion by opening the seals. So things are starting to take place. This is taking place in the future. Obviously, from John's standpoint, I also believe from our standpoint, this is things that haven't happened yet in the future. Okay, he says, come and see. One of the four living creatures is inviting John to watch what takes place when the first seal is opened. Okay. And I, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. A white horse, in Greek, hippos leukos. And I, no, not yet. I took the liberty of putting the Greek into Translator into Latin letters there so you can read it because some people were expressing confusion while they were trying to read the Greek and it looked kind of funny, so I got it in parentheses there and words you can read if you can't read Greek. So there you go. It just means white horse, pretty literal. And now a picture of a beautiful white horse there. There's shadow facts running across the grass. So, <laughs> all right, next slide. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So who is the rider on the white horse? Is that Gandalf riding Shadowfax? Is that really who it is? Okay. But Dan says that's what he thinks it is. All right. That'd be kind of cool, right? Shadowfax, the lord of all horses. All right. Is it the Pope? Is it Jesus Christ? Is it the Antichrist? Who is it? All right. Well, the view that says this is Catholicism, I expressed before, that's one view, says the white horse is Catholicism. They say, well, white is the color of the Catholic Church. The Pope wears white, he wears a crown, and they point out that the rider has a bow, but doesn't say anything about arrows. So this means he's conquering by peaceful means, he's like a peaceful conqueror. And you can say, well, the Catholic Church sort of conquered a lot of, a lot of the world, in Europe and Latin America, all over the place. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty interesting. However, let's look at that a little closer. The rider's clothing is never mentioned, never given a color. It doesn't say it's white. We don't know that. Could be, but it doesn't say it. And the rider is wearing a crown, a Stephanos, okay? That's the crown of a victor. That's important, like that little laurel wreath they wear. That's what he's wearing. If it was a bishop's mitre or the pope's crown, it would have been a different word. It would have been mitra, like a, a mitre, tiara, like a tiara, or kamilaukion. I need new glasses. I'm starting to get a little... A little off prescription here. Once I hit 40, it started getting a little bit worse. I had the same prescription since I was 12 years old, and I'm finally starting to need new ones. All right. Kamilaukian. Okay, so this is what he's talking about. He's wearing this, okay? That's a Stephanos, a little laurel wreath. You like when you win the Olympic Games, you put that thing on your head? That's what he's wearing. He's not wearing this. 
the bishop's mitre, the pope's little tiara crown thing there, that's not what he's wearing, okay? He's wearing the Stephanos, the laurel wreath. Okay, next slide. The rider is carrying a bow, that's true. It doesn't say he's carrying arrows, but arrows are implied. I mean, it's like saying, well, he's carrying a rifle, but it doesn't say he's got bullets in it, so he's a peaceful conqueror. Otherwise, it would have said he's got bullets. Well, he's carrying a bow. It's implied he has arrows, okay? It's a picture of someone conquering swiftly, a mounted archer. He's riding fast. He has a bow and arrow. You can shoot out. He's not, he doesn't have to fight on his feet with a sword. And he's given a victor's crown. He doesn't already have the crown. He's given a victor's crown for his conquest. I don't think Catholicism makes sense here. It doesn't really make sense. He's not wearing a pope's tiara or a, a bishop's mitre and he's a conqueror, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, some say this represents the second coming of Christ. Is that Jesus? This would put it before the Great Tribulation, though, because the Tribulation is coming after this. This is kind of the beginning of it. So Christ isn't going to come back before that happens. He's coming back after it happens. It doesn't really make sense. And if it was Christ, we say, well, yeah, well, in Revelation 19, we see him coming back on a white horse. That's the second coming. So this is like a preview of it. Um, yeah, you can go here. Okay, in Revelation 19, we're going to read that, though. Now, this is the second coming in Revelation 19. See if this sounds like the same thing. Now, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. Now, those are not... The crown of a victor, that's the crown of a sovereign. That's a diademos, a diadem. Many crowns of a sovereign. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, that's clearly not the same thing, okay? I don't think that's talking about the second coming of Christ. Very, very different. The Antichrist, to me, it makes the most sense here. So, remember, the Antichrist is a false, he's an alternative Christ, Literally, antichristos, it means instead of Christ. He's like a fake, alternate Christ pretending to be Christ. He's an imposter Christ. So him coming forth at the beginning of this, him and his kind of global conquest, the global government conquest. Next slide. It makes sense that the two would be depicted this way, though, to contrast them. Okay? So Jesus and Antichrist. So Jesus and the Antichrist are depicted in various ways throughout the book. Okay, we see the vision of Jesus in chapter 1, when John sees him. He's standing up, glorious and bright. Uh, in chapter 19, it is second coming on the horse. And the Antichrist in chapter 6, which I believe this writer, also 13 and 17 is the beast, a little bit different. But in this example in chapter 6, it contrasts really well with what we see in chapter 19. We got this writer, and we have the real one when he really comes back in chapter 19. Very effective contrast. Next slide. So the Antichrist is seen conquering swiftly at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. So it's the Antichrist like his world government system. Um, after the church represented by 24 elders are worshiping in heaven, after that, okay, traditional view of the first seal being the Antichrist and his world government system, like the conquest of that whole operation, makes the most sense. It's something happening on the earth. All right, moving on. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Now, who is the rider on the red horse? Is it communism? Is it war and murder? Let's look. Now, the view that says it's communism says, well, red is the color of communism. We all know that. They say it, and the flags are all red. International communism is known, of course, for conquering by war and violent revolution. Communist governments have killed 
literally tens of millions of people in the 20th century alone. So that, you know, okay, I kind of see that red, you know, the killing. Okay, kind of makes sense. Now, until we see a red horse, hippos piros, literally means a fire horse or a horse of fire. Puros, that word in Greek, it's where we get the word pyro from. Funeral pyre, pyrotechnic, it literally means fire. If it was red horse, it would have been hippos kokinos or hippos, what's that? Eruthros. Okay, that's, that, the second one would be kind of like a ruddy red color, brownish red. So there we go. There's a fire horse. Now, it's not a real horse, okay? It's digital art, so no horses were harmed in the production of this slide presentation. But that's what, he's, that's what he saw, a fire horse. It says a fire horse. I don't think he acts, well, he meant, he meant red. Go, go back. Thank you. Um, he meant red. He just, he just wrote fire just because he didn't know how to write red. Well, the Greeks knew what red was. There was a word in Greek for red. You know, the, the Greeks gave us Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. They, they knew how to say the word red. So I believe this was chosen deliberately. This says a horse of fire. Okay, next slide. It was given to him to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another, literally translated that they might slaughter each other. A great sword, a makaira magale. Okay, in the next slide, that's the sword he was carrying, a makaira, and that was a single-handed sword. It, it, the design of the sword gave a very, very powerful, is good for, like, for chopping really hard. Okay, so that's what he's carrying, a, a large one of those. Okay? Now, again, as with the first example, communism doesn't make sense here, I don't think. The tradition is not red, it's, it's fire. The traditional view of the second seal as war and killing unleashed upon the earth makes the most sense. Okay, now, of course, there have always been wars. There's always been killing. But this would be, in this instance, war and murder and killing to a, a greater extent than before. Widespread. Okay. Moving along. Next one. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, so another voice talking, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, who is the rider on the black horse? Is it capitalism? Is it famine? Is it one of the Nazgul riding from Mordor? That's what Dan thinks it was. No, I'm just kidding. No. Okay, now the view, the view that says capitalism says, well, okay. Look, the traditional color associated with capitalism is black. The scales, well, that's, that's commerce, you know, and trading and all that stuff. And the voice giving the price for wheat and barley, that, that's kind of like a stock market quote. That's, what it's, that's kind of what it sounds like. So I, that represents capitalism. Because you got the other ones, you know, you know kind of, uh, Catholicism, communism, uh, capitalism. Kind of, you know, that, that works. Okay, let's look at it. The black horse, hippos melas. Melas, that's where we get the word melanin from. Like pigment in your skin. Hippos melas, that's just a, next one, a black horse. There he is, proud riding along the prairie there. Okay, next slide. A pair of scales or balances, zugon, that's literally one balance, but you know, a pair, that's kind of what it is. Now, that's a balance used to measure goods in a market, so that's kind of straightforward. A quart of wheat for denarius and three quarts of barley for denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Well, what is that talking about? Next slide. Now, the, KG, the King James Version says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Well, a word measure or a quart is a coinix. That's 1.09 liters, so that's about a quart. The New King James says quart. That's pretty accurate. It's about a quart. And a KJV says penny, denarius. Well, the actual word there is denarius. That's a, a Roman, the Latin word, so I just put it in Latin there. Denarius, a Roman coin, equal to about a day's wage for a laborer. Like a common, unskilled laborer, that was about a day's wage back then. So, that's a lot of money for a quart of wheat, a day's wage. Do not harm or hurt the oil and the wine. Harm or hurt, in the case these, do not disturb would be a better translation. Or leave it alone. Don't touch it. Oil, that, that's olive oil. Lion, that's just olive oil. It's not talking about petroleum. 
okay? It's olive oil. So a day's wage for a small loaf of wheat, wheat bread, or three loaves of barley, barley was cheaper, and you couldn't even get olive oil or wine. Now, the, think about the context here. These were the staples, the staple dietary items of that time, okay? A common working man, they would eat bread, they would have olive oil with it, dip it in there, and they would drink wine. Now, we kind of look at wine as a little more special, you know, drink uh, rather than beer. But at that time, it was a lot weaker, uh, lower alcohol content. That was just a common beverage. Everybody drank wine. You drank wine with your meal. So the stuff that they normally ate, the bread was a day's wage. Now, what's a, what's a day's wage for an average American, lo like a low-skilled laborer, entry level? I don't know what it is. Say $100 or something. I don't give or take. $100 for a loaf of bread? Can you imagine that? And you can't even get oil and wine with it? That's pretty bad. Now, these are staple dietary items. Now, this describes a time of poverty and food shortages. Now, you think people were freaking out about food shortages, worried about that after COVID and all this stuff. And I mean, this, imagine a $100 loaf of bread, you know, and you can't even get other stuff. Um, this is a really bad food shortage, famine, poverty, okay? A lot of economic hardship, okay? Now, I don't think capitalism is the best explanation here, particularly because that whole argument kind of stands or falls together. If the first one's not Catholicism and the second one's not communism, it wouldn't make sense for this to be capitalism. The third seal as a like famine and poverty is what makes the most sense here to me. Okay, moving on. The next one. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, to kill him with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, who is the rider on the pale horse? Is it the Grim Reaper? Is it death and hell? Is it Islam? Is it Morgoth and Sauron out to destroy Middle Earth? Now, the view that says Islam, let's look at that, now, this is what the argument is for this view. Well, the word translated pale is actually green. And while the color of Islam is green, we all know that, uh, Islam often conquers by the sword, violent, you know, wars, leaves death in its wake. Many Islamic countries are also in kind of poverty-stricken areas, see a lot of famine and death. Okay, that's the argument there. Let's see what is it saying. All right, is that true? Pale horse, hippos chloros. Yes, that literally does mean a pale green horse. Not bright green, a pale green, or some translations say it, sickly pale. So chloros is the pale green color of new, like new shoots, new little blades of grass, or like the new buds on a tree, kind of that pale yellowy green color. It's not regular green. It's not like, it's not that kind of green there. That would be prasinos, okay? It's a different word. So it's, next slide, it's that color green. Those are little sprouts. I don't know what those are, some kind of peas or something, whatever, beans or something. It's that color green. It's not that color green. That's the flag of Saudi Arabia. It's not that color green, okay? It's like a pale, sickly green. So I, I just found this picture, next one, pale horse. That's the best I could find a line of like a kind of pale, greenish-looking horse, something like that. Okay, now, the rider is called death, Thanatos, and hell or Hades Hades, okay, that's the actual Greek word, Hades, follows with him. Now, Hades is used here to represent the Hebrew word Sheol. You see that in the Old Testament a lot, Sheol. That means the grave. It's the temporary place of resting for the dead before the judgment. So you've got death and you've got the grave, Hades, Sheol, coming after him. Okay, kind of straightforward. Now, power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Well, what does that mean? Is that the fourth of the land area? A fourth of the population? Doesn't really say but either way, that's a lot of people. To kill with the sword, hunger, death, and by the beasts of the earth. By the sword, that's a romphaya. That, if you remember some of the early lessons I did, it was a great long sword, a two-handed sword. Okay? And beasts, the rion, that's like wild animals. Okay? I know the KJV calls those four living creatures around the throne of God four beasts. But it actually, the New King James has living creatures. That's actually more accurate, living ones. But beasts here, this is beast, like a wild animal. It's used negative, like monsters or something, okay? Killed by the wild beasts. Now, 
Once again, you probably know where I was going with this. Islam does not really work here. A couple reasons. Not the same color green. Doesn't seem like a religion. Fourth seal seems to represent widespread death on the earth following the first three riders. Okay, it seems to fit. Okay. So what are the first four seals? They represent forces at work or events beginning on the earth during the Great Tribulation. It starts with the conquest by the Antichrist and his world government system, which brings war and killing, followed by economic collapse and famine, leading to widespread death. So are these the same horsemen? Now, this is an argument. Some people bring this up. What about Zechariah chapter 6? Okay, Zechariah is one of the Old Testament prophets. And in chapter 6 of Zechariah, you see horses there too. Are these the same horsemen as depicted in Zechariah 6? Some say they're the same thing. Now, before I begin with that, some people say, well, it's chapter 6 of Revelation. It's chapter 6 of Zechariah. That must be talking about the same thing. But remember, when the Bible was written, there weren't any chapters and verses. So that's, that's a coincidence, but that's all it is. Okay, let's take a look at Zechariah. What do you, what's he saying here? Then I, as a Zechariah, the prophet speaking, then I turned and raised my eyes and looked. And behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country. The white are going after them. And the dappled are going toward the south country. When the strong steeds went, oh, then the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, Go, walk to and fro, th fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro... I think I missed a sentence there. There. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. Okay. And he called to me and spoke to me saying, See, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. All right. So what is this? Is this the same thing as the first four seals in Revelation chapter 6? Now, the hor in, in this one here, Zechariah, the horses are in teams pulling chariots. And they appear to just be regular colors. Okay, these aren't like mystical, crazy-looking horses with a you know, grim reaper on or something like that or a fiery horse. They're just chariots being pulled by horses. There's a red with kind of like a chestnut horse, white, black, and a dappled horse. So next one, there's a, there's a red, there's a chestnut there. Fine, healthy horse. There's a dappled. Okay, so that's a dappled. The, the black and white were just black and white horses. There's a dappled. Okay, now, the KJV says, for the fourth one, it says grizzled and bay for the fourth chariot. Well, bay is a color too. It's like a brownish red with a black tail and black mane and you know, black lower legs. Uh, the word translated bay, I would seem, is translated strong or powerful in more modern Bibles. Like the New King James said strong. And the, the fourth ones were dappled, strong steeds. Okay, not grizzled and bay. Um, it could also mean piebald, which is, next slide, a horse like that. So it could be either one. Some of the, sometimes there's words in languages, like in English, the word bear, B-E-A-R. Okay, does it mean bear like you bear a burden? Or bear with me? Or does it mean the furry animal that will kill you and eat you in the wild? Could be either one. Depends on the context. So this, this fourth one could be dappled and that, or dappled and then strong steeds referring to all of them. Whatever context you think, next slide, works best. So the chariots are spirits that go forth from God in different directions. Okay. The red ones aren't mentioned. doesn't say what direction they're going in. But it says the black and white go to the north, and the dappled or piebald go to the south. Okay. So the KGV says the black and white horses have quieted my spirit in the north country. So God's saying they've quieted my spirit. Now, some say, well, that's, that's a bad thing. And the argument that the black horse represents capitalism, and this is the same thing as Revelation, says, well, yeah, see, it's quieted the spirit of God because, you know, the consumerism and the materialism, that means it's, it's kind of a bad thing. Like the spirit's kind of, you know, we, we can't talk about it. 
Now, a, be, a more literal translation is, they've given my spirit rest. They've given my spirit rest in the North Country. So it's actually a positive thing. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. All right. So this vision is very different from John's vision in Revelation 6. We should not look at the two passages as referring to the same thing. Okay, the, remember, the, the chariots in Zechariah, those were, the angel said these are spirits that go forth from the Lord into all the earth. Okay, the ones in John, these are like bad things happening on the earth when the lamb, when Jesus opens these seals up. So, you know, just because there's sets of horses, there's, well, there's four horses, so it must be the same thing. We shouldn't assume that. It doesn't necessarily mean that just because there's four horses of different colors, that they're the same thing. So I don't believe they're the same. Okay, so then again, what are the first four seals? They represent forces at work or events taking place on the earth during the Great Tribulation. Okay, they're starting with the conquest by the Antichrist and his world government system, which brings war and killing, followed by economic collapse and famine leading to widespread death. Now, these are things that are happening, that are taking place when these seals are opened. The seals open and then this happens. Okay, so if these were, say, geopolitical forces like Catholicism or capitalism, communism, Islam, those are thousands of years old. Okay, so this didn't, like, the first seal was opened, oh, that was, it need to be all out of order. You know, Catholicism, how old is that? First couple centuries AD, communism started, what, mid-19th century, early 20th century, capitalism, whenever, uh, Islam, six, seven hundred A.D. So it would just be kind of all over the place if that's what they represented. That doesn't make sense. It makes sense that these are events and forces being set into motion during at the beginning of the Great Tribulation when these seals are starting to be opened, okay? So I, I believe that makes the most sense. The Antichrist and his world government conquest, war and killing, economic collapse and poverty and famine, and then widespread death. All right. So we should avoid using, again, we want to keep this in mind, we shouldn't be looking at magazine covers or current events articles to interpret scripture, okay? We should let the text speak for itself in its literary and historical context. Remember, we want to do exegesis, not eisegesis. Exegesis is what you do when you look at the text and you draw the meaning out of the text. Eisegesis would be putting a meaning into the text. We don't want to do that when we're looking at the Bible. Now, if you wanted, you're reading a, a you know, you're reading a fiction novel, you know, you like to read novels like a Western or a mystery novel or something. You can read into the text that way. But when you're doing Bible study, you want to do exegesis. You want to get the meaning out of the text. Look at the text itself. All right. So that's, let's see, next slide. There you go. There's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I'm going to end this one right there. The rest of chapter 6, we do not have time for. And that will be for another lesson, the remaining two seals and then kind of an overview of what's going on in chapter 6, like a, a bird's eye, kind of 30,000 foot view. So that's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's in tonight's lesson. I hope you got something out of that. Let's all stand. And we're just going to close out in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your opportunity. The opportunity you've given us to come here and to worship you and to study your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us to have a desire and a hunger to learn your word and to understand your word. Help us to understand prophecy in the book of Revelation and not be afraid of your word or not think it's something to be uh, avoided because it's too complicated or too confusing. Touch our hearts, Lord, and help us to understand your word that you may be glorified, Lord, that we may glorify your kingdom, that we may share this with other people, Lord, and be blessed and serve you more fully. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I hope you got something out of that. I hope you learned something and you're dismissed and we'll see you Sunday. God bless you.